Our study begins in verse 28 through verse 34. Would you read along with me, please? Peter said to him, and of course he's talking to Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel. Please highlight that part. For me and the gospel, this deals with motive. Will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields. And with them persecutions. Now if there's anybody here with a bottle of whiteout. And you want to white out any part of this that with the persecutions, but obviously that's part and parcel of receiving the gospel and serving the Lord. So Jesus is, and persecutions, and incidentally, this is mentioned only in Mark's gospel. And then in, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him, Three days later, he will rise. Father, this message is so important to all of us. It deals with your gift to us. And the gift is one another, Lord. And we thank you that you loved us this much. Jesus, I often pray, help us to love you more after understanding the value of the gift of your church. Help us to love you more than we've ever loved you before. Let our joy overflow. And may our lives bring you glory. Lord, check our hearts, our motives behind all that we do. And finally, Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here in this second service or anybody that you've got coming in the next service, Lord, if they don't know you, if they're not yet born again, use this day to give them the gift of your body the body that was broken, the body that was murdered, the body that rose in glory and is still alive. But also, Lord, this body, the church of Jesus Christ, your most precious gift to the world that we live in. We love you, God, and we're grateful for all you've done. So bless our time, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me start out with a little bit of a warning. This is a message that takes great faith. It's contrary to so many of the things that we've been taught that, that you're going to have to open your heart and you say, okay, Lord, can I really trust you? And that's what Jesus wants you to do. Now, the problem, the frustration with a message like this is that the people who need to hear it the most are usually the people who aren't here. I'm preaching to the choir. You guys are here. You understand the body and the value of the body, your, your responsibility to the body. But this is a message that needs to ring loud and clear in the very day and age that we live in of these very last days. You see, all over the nation there are professing Christians, and I'm not <coughs> doubting their salvation. That's between them and the Lord. But people say things like, well, you know, I can be a Christian and don't have to go to church. I don't really need to be there. I've got other things I could do. I can rest. Some people say, well, you know, I'm just going to commune with God alone, with nature. If there's a fishing rod or a golf club in their hand, that's understandable. <laughs> but the idea is they fail to realize the magnitude of the gift that God has given to all of us in his body, the church of Jesus Christ. It is an absolute vital element for Jesus and as he's explaining to his disciples once again, this is the third time, as he's explaining to them that he's going to die. Now they're tuning him out. They don't hear that part. Even today, they still don't hear it. But as he's explaining to them about his sacrifice, his service to the world at large, there's still people who think that 
this gift that was so important that Jesus shared it with them at this point. Well, I don't really need it. It's okay. I pray that's not the case for anyone here. You know, sometimes we can go to church. We can come to church. We can participate in the Sunday activities, but really never really get involved. Jesus is telling you, just as he's telling the 12, he's telling you that this is the most important thing that I've left you because believe me, when I go, you're going to need one another as never before. Today, the real value of the church from the one who gave the church birth. Verse 28, it says, Peter said to him, to Jesus, we have left everything to follow you. Now in the margin of your Bible, by verse 28, write the word motives. Because this is really about motive. Peter is coming. He's the one that steps forward and, and speaks to the Lord. But it deals with the motives of all of the 12. It also deals with your motives and mine. You remember the story. It's been a couple of weeks since before we went on vacation. Uh, the rich young ruler has just walked away from Jesus and he's really, really sad. Jesus, in fact, was even more sad. But the rich young ruler walks away because Jesus has told him what he needs. He asks the question, what must I do to obtain eternal life? And Jesus basically said, you know who I am. Here's what you have to do. Sell everything that you have. Give it to the poor and follow me. I want to emphasize one more time that Jesus has nothing against wealth. If there are some of you who are here who are wealthy, we love you. And we're more than happy to receive your gifts. That's wonderful. But when your gifts possess you, as was the case with the rich young ruler, when they're the things your security is in your finances, well, that's the place where Jesus is going to find offense. Because nothing in your life can come before him. And the rich young ruler, as he's walking away sad, as Jesus' heart is broken, imagine the look on the face of the disciples because then, like many people now, they believe that if somebody was wealthy, it was a particular sign that God had blessed them. And they would envy wealthy people. Boy, God really loves them. God blesses them. Again, we do pretty much the same thing 2,000 years later. And now he's walking away. He's sad. Jesus is sad. And the first thing that comes to the disciples' mind, voiced by Peter, is, well, if that's the case, why am I doing this? What's in it for me? You know, way back in my old life before Christ, I wrote a sales manual called WIFM, W-I-I-F-M, and that stood for What's In It For Me. And it was used not just in the automobile industry, but in other places, because it demonstrated that all you had to do to prove to a customer that the benefit for them buying your product was greater than if they didn't buy it. And it's pretty easy to do if you tell somebody, okay, if you do this, my product is going to do this, and you're going to benefit from it. And if you can convince them of that, believe me, the deals get closed. Well, that's exactly what Peter is trying to communicate. What's in it for me? Now, here's the problem here. This really does reveal Peter's heart and the heart of the disciples, the other 11. Now, we know that because we know that they're constantly arguing among one another, thinking Jesus isn't listening about who's going to be the greatest. When Jesus leaves, who's going to be the greatest? And they would argue to the point of real contention. They were wondering what their role was going to be in heaven. In fact, next week we're going to see James and John sort of scoop all of the others. And they're going to come to Jesus and say, say, we want you to do whatever we ask. And Jesus is going to ask them, and he's going to tell them, look, I can't do that. But he's going to make them examine their hearts and their motives. Well, far too many of us, even as Christians, with 2,000 years of history, knowing exactly what God has done, we follow Jesus expecting, hoping to get something from it. Well, Lord, if I, if I come to you in faith and you'll fix my marriage, you'll fix my job, you'll fix whatever the problems I have in life, and, and everything will be happy and I'll be blessed. And, and, and sometimes our motives are revealed. And it's really important that we listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit because as I say to you so many times over the years, Motive is everything. If you're here today and you haven't been getting your prayers answered, that's 
likely the reason why. James says that we have not because we ask not. I think most of us are pretty generous in asking God for the things that we need. But then he says, or you ask amiss or you ask with the wrong motive. Motive is everything. And whatever we do, we really and truly need to examine our motives. Why are we serving the Lord? Why aren't we serving the Lord? What's our motives? What are the things that are getting in the way? Peter's heart is revealed to him at this point. Well, well, what's in it for me? We've left everything. Are you going to bless us? Is really the basis of his question. So Jesus sort of straightens him out, and he does it. And this is where we really need to exercise faith, because this is a hard message. He says, I tell you the truth. Whenever you read that, if you have a King James, it's verily, verily. It's called a double amen. And Jesus is simply saying, pay attention to this. It's important. So I tell you the truth. No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them persecutions. And in the age to come, there's a clear division between what is temporal and what is eternal, and in the age to come, eternal life. And then in verse 31, he says, but many who are first will be last, and the last first. Now, before I go into digging this up a little bit, let me sort of get to the punchline because there's a very simple point that's being made here. And it's that no one who gives up anything or everything to and for Jesus will be sorry for it. We have to have the faith to believe that, and I don't think many of us do. We're holding on to things that we know God doesn't want us uh, want in our lives. We, we, we hold on to relationships. We hold on to bad habits. And God says, no, no, you can trust me. Give it up. Give up everything. In other words, Jesus is saying, make me the priority of your life, and then everything else will work out. I had a young woman that we haven't seen for a while. I love her so much. And she drives in from Austin for church. And at the, after last service, she came to me and she said, she said, I'm trying really hard to find that life balance, Pastor Ron. And I said, well, you heard the message. I, what I told you was there is no balance until Jesus is everything. We sing a song, you're my all in all. We sing it to him. If we really meant that, our lives would be in perfect balance. And she said, I know, and I was convicted, but I'm really trying hard. I said, don't try. Just make sure that Jesus is first. And she told me that God has really been blessing her. And I said, well, that's wonderful. And she said, well, that's why I work so much, because I don't want to let him down. I said, if you're working too much to serve the Lord, you're busier than he wants you to be. Jesus sets that example himself for service. And her response was, I know, thank you. And she went away. There's no balance in life apart from making Jesus first the priority, the singular priority in your life. Not your marriage, not your career, not your hobbies, not your hopes and not your dreams. Just Jesus. And then he pours out his blessings upon you. And in this Bible study, he's asking all of us to have enough faith to believe that. And if you don't and you're still holding on to some of those things... And you're really going to have to deal with why you refuse to take him at his word. He's never broken a promise to you. He has a plan for you that's better than anything you can possibly imagine. And all you have to do is really and truly believe it. I'm not talking about believing in here. I'm talking about believing in here. When what you know intellectually gets to your heart, it's amazing. Your hands just sort of open up. And all those things that were so important to you just sort of fade away, and Jesus says, now you get it. And I promise every one of you here at Calvary Chapel that he will demonstrate to you once and for all that he alone is trustworthy. Now, the passage that follows demonstrates just how important it is to be a servant. And we'll get more into that next week, but it's so important that Jesus says that we need, by putting him first in our lives, we need to understand that our life here temporally on planet Earth in 2022 in San Antonio, Texas, is a life that must be committed, dedicated to serving him with all of our hearts. 
If you do that, you might wonder, well, what's in it for me? Here's the answer, and it's spectacular. Now, Matthew reports that Jesus began the answer to the question by making this promise to them. This is Matthew's gospel, same incident. He says, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, if the disciples are listening, Peter would never have come to him and said, Lord, we've left everything to follow you. He would have said, you've got a throne for me? And I'm going to be judging the 12 tribes of Israel? Remember all the time they spent arguing about who's going to be the greatest among them and, and what their role is going to be and how important it's going to be in Jesus' kingdom. Now, they're thinking now, of course, because they're thinking temporally. Jesus is saying, no, in the age to come, when I establish my kingdom, then I'm going to give you a throne. Do you think any one of them would have been disappointed having abandoned their lives to Jesus Christ on that moment when Jesus says, Peter, James, John, Andrew, and the rest of them, here's your throne. You talk about a new piece of furniture. Here's your throne. This is because you served and because you trusted me and I made you some wonderful and glorious promises and this is the fulfillment of them. You wanted to be important. Here's your throne, big shot. And that's exactly what he's telling them. Now, he's saying exactly the same thing to you and me when we abandon everything to Jesus. The rewards will be more spectacular than you can imagine. That's why we who are temporally focused need to work really, really hard to change that focus on things above. That's why the Apostle Paul writes, to the church at Colossae, set your mind and your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. He didn't say set your mind on your income, your mind on your career, your mind on the things that you enjoy. He didn't set, set your mind and your heart on family. Those things are important. But Jesus says, put me first and everything else I promise you will work out better. Remember, the mind is the place of decision. That's usually where we have the problem. The heart is the place of affection. I have no doubt that everybody in this room loves Jesus. But have you decided to put him first? Have you decided that he's more important to you than your wife or your husband or your children or your family members? Jesus said, if you will make that commitment to me, I'm going to give you a family that you never dreamed of. Now, before getting into the, the two verses, 29 and 30, that I'm going to spend most of the time on today, I also want to remind you that Jesus includes a parable also recorded in Matthew's gospel at the same time that lets the 12 know that his work is not going to look like they thought it would look. They're walking around. They're expecting a kingdom. They're expecting that Israel is going to be uh, freed from Roman uh, rule and oppression. And Jesus said, it's not going to look that way. Now, he didn't tell him, you know, there's going to be like a couple of thousand years before this kingdom comes. But here's what he's saying. He's saying, though it doesn't look like you expect it to look, don't lose your eternal perspective. Too many of us, we look at the world that we live in and it's just disintegrating before our very eyes and it's doing it at a pace that we can't even fathom. And we think, well, well things are turning out not the way I thought. Jesus said, just hang on. Put me first, and everything is going to work out. And he tells them in the parable about the parable of the workers in the vineyard when he explains that while the gospel first came, Jesus came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That it wouldn't be Israel that comes to the kingdom first. And he's letting them know that there's a plan, a plan that you will implement as my apostles and I'm on a mission, and that mission is to go find a whole bunch of Texans and win them to Jesus Christ. So it doesn't always look like we think it's going to look like Jesus. That's okay. Just trust me and look to me, and then I'm going to give you all of this wonderful promises that will be fulfilled. So what's in it for Peter? What's in it for you and me? This is wonderful. I'm going to go back and read verses 29 and 30 as we discuss them. Again, a warning, faith is necessary here 
This will be foreign to most of our hearing. Here's the promise. He said, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel. Again, that's got to be your motive. Will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. And it's so important, he repeats it again. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Now, it's hard for us to understand from a Jewish context, and we need to remember the Jewishness of Jesus' ministry, or we lose the value to us of this. In the culture that Jesus ministered in, for a Jew to convert to Christianity, we know that happened in droves right after the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Whenever Jews converted from Judaism to Christianity, they were completely disowned by family members. They were completely cut off. They were cut off from religious life. They certainly couldn't go to synagogue or to the temple. They were cut off from economic life. They couldn't work because the outer courts of the temple was where much of the marketing occurred. But they were also cut off from their own families, the people that they'd grown to love and depend upon. And they were cut off just because they came to faith in Jesus Christ. And that's so important because they would be alone. And we know in the first century church that's exactly what happened. The church was entirely Jewish. And as these Jews found faith in Jesus Christ, they were all alone. They had nobody to help them. Family was gone. They only had one another. And that's what was going on. Imagine how difficult it was for them to leave family. Now, we have a sense of that difficulty because a lot of us have been abandoned by our family members, or at least some of them, because we are too crazy about Jesus. They'll look at you and say things like, look, you can come, but leave Jesus out of this. We don't want to hear about Jesus anymore. And most of us, we've got to be able to say, look, I love you. I want you in heaven. So if you invite me, Jesus comes. And if you invite me, I'm going to talk about Jesus because I don't have another message. And we've got to be willing to risk our earthly or our temporal relationships with people that we love so deeply in order to be a witness to them for eternity. I know it's hard, especially when family gets hostile. And we've all had family members just close the doors on us. But remember, think about heaven without the people you love. And it's got to be willing, as I said a moment ago, to risk an earthly temporal relationship in order to make sure that your witness about Jesus isn't compromised. You've got to tell them about the one who has the answers for their problems and their pain. Sin, Jesus will forgive. He loves you. He will accept you. That's our message. And when the world, our family members turn against us, we've got to expect that. It's got to be okay. We don't like it, but it's got to be okay. It's even more difficult then for them than it is for us now. Now, that's the basis for all of these promises. Here's what he's saying. Peter... James, John, all of the rest of you, you're going to have a hundred times as many homes to go to as you do right now. If you follow me, you're going to have a hundred times as many families to go to. You're going to have a hundred times as many fields to eat from. Jesus is simply saying, you'll never go hungry if you're following me. Think about that for a moment. In the early church, when they were cut off from all phases of cultural life, they never had to worry about missing a meal. Jesus had earlier taught them in their prayer to pray like this, give us this day our daily bread. Whatever I need today, Lord, you'll provide. Jesus saying, look, I'm going to provide a family for you that will provide you whatever you need. Christian hospitality was essential for survival in the days of the early church, and that's why Christians opened their homes and hearts to those who had been cut off, those who had been disowned. There would be many fields to provide sustenance, food, so they would never go hungry. And they would provide brothers and sisters in numbers that they never imagined possible. Consider this. If 
Paul and I came on hard times right now. Um, most of you know our testimony. We were homeless as a result of my sin, uh, once having been very, very wealthy, and then really in a period of about a year and a half, we were homeless. And we had nowhere to go. Now, there was somebody who opened a garage for us, and that was great. But today, if that happened to Paula or to me, we'd have hundreds, multiplied hundreds of homes to go to. We'd never be alone. We wouldn't go hungry. We have family, people who love us and people who've cared for us. And we wouldn't have to worry about where our next meal is coming from. That's why the family of Christ is so important. That's why it's such a wonderful gift. In fact, from Jesus' perspective, the most valuable gift heaven has for any of us, this side of heaven is each other. You know, I love your kids. You know that. Your kids, for the most part, love me. Now I make them. I give them stuff. But <laughs> I love the fact that they come running in. Now, I've got a motive. I told you motive is everything. My motive is simple. I give them candy, and I hug them, and we talk about things. And then I say, now, remember what you promised me. And they'll say, what? And I said, you promised that when Paul and I go into the nursing home, you'll come take care of us. <laughs> and they just smile, and they laugh. But you see, that's what the body of Christ does, what it provides for one another. And the Christians, now again, I'm preaching to the choir, but the Christians who are out there saying, well, I don't need church. I've got better things to do. They're the ones who don't really understand what this gift is all about, how valuable, how precious it really is. One of the things that happens here way too often and this is me lovingly scolding you, if this fits. We find out that some of you, too many of you, are going through really difficult things, and we find out from other sources. And we don't find out from you, and we find out too late, many times too late to help you. And nobody at Calvary Chapel of San Antonio ever has to go through anything alone. If you do, it's a choice you've made. And Jesus is telling you today, it's a bad choice. It's a bad choice. You don't have to go through anything alone. Whatever it is, illness, finances, loneliness, discouragement, depression, maybe just the world and, and the way things are turning out has got you down. Whatever it is, you don't have to go through those things alone. Inflation, if you've tried to fill up your gas tank recently, some of you are struggling to do that. I'm old enough, and some of you will laugh at this, but I'm old enough to remember when we'd go to the gas station and say, give me 25 cents worth. And that was enough to get you around town. Now you got to go say, give me $100 worth and it doesn't fill your tank. If you've been to a grocery store, and I want to confess at the beginning, I do not do grocery stores. But if you go to a grocery store, you know how expensive everything is. Paul and I were on vacation, and on vacation we ran out of a couple things, and, and because I don't do grocery stores, I want to go into a, just a, a drug store and get some, some extra strength Tylenol and a couple of other things. And we go in the store, it's a quick in and quick out. And, and I mean, we got just a couple of things. Now, because I don't go to grocery stores, I don't know how much things cost. And I'm standing by Paula because she always pays, and she's there. And I'm telling you, we have 10 things maybe, and they're not big things. And the lady looks at Paula and says, your total is $48.26. And I said, what did you buy? <laughs> My goodness, we didn't get anything. You, you must have rung some stuff up twice. And she said no, and Paula looked at the thing, and she said, Ron, just the Tylenol was $18 and some change. $18, I ought to be able to have my own pharmaceutical factory for $18. <laughs> but you see, I say that because I know that you guys are going through difficult things, and this church body is here to help you. When family won't help you, when you don't want to ask, this family will help you. That's what we do. It's our responsibility. It's our privilege. 
Because that's what real family does for one another. And that's why Jesus says, I'm going to offend some of you with saying this. That's why Jesus says that this family of faith has to be a priority over your own blood family. You guys know Paula's story. You've heard our testimonies. But when we left California, Paula was discouraged about a bunch of things, afraid of other things. Our sons were there, and she was leaving her children, and they weren't saved. And she thought, well, who's going to save them? Lord, you need me here. And then there were other friends and family members that we were leaving, people that we, up to that point, had always been able to depend on if, if there was something that we really needed. We were leaving our first church family as Christians. I'd just been saved got out of Bible college, and, and we, we had a church family that actually loved us, and we had an opportunity to serve there. <laughs> and Paula was depressed about it. God gave her her life verse. It's actually because Paula is precious to the Lord. You guys know that it's a life chapter. You and I, we get a verse, she gets a chapter. And her life chapter is Isaiah 54. The first couple of verses say, This single barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song, shout for joy. How can I shout for joy if I'm leaving my family? You who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. Now when it says, says the Lord, that's a promise from him. And Paul had to realize at that point that God was saying, I know you're leaving things that are difficult to leave, but what I'm going to add to you is more than you can ask or imagine right now. You can't begin to understand the family that I've got prepared for you. And God has ever been faithful because each one of you are our gift from God of fulfillment of that promise. Paula is Mama Paula to people that haven't even met her yet. So she has children, brothers and sisters, family members and friends in absolute abundance, hundreds and hundreds, and it never could have been done if our focus wasn't solely on being obedient to the Lord and pleasing Him. All of that to say that if you're not following Jesus, if you're not willing to give anything and everything, you don't really understand what faith is yet. You got to give up everything. Open your hands. Let him take all of the junk out. And then you have to challenge yourself. Do I really believe the promises of the word of God? Do I really believe that a God is for me who can be against me? Do I really believe that I'm more than a conqueror through him who loved us? And if you do that, you can leave your hands open and he'll start putting stuff in there. And you're going to find out the stuff that he puts in you've now let go of your stuff. The stuff that he puts in is infinitely greater and far more wonderful than anything that you were trying to hold on to. And we, Paula and I, we have lived that life. And I want to tell you, that to be your pastor is the greatest privilege of my life, second only to being her husband. And that's because the family God has given me is the best, sometimes dysfunctional, a whole bunch of times strange. But it is the best family on the face of the earth. And why would I be surprised? Because that's exactly what Jesus is promising them. And isn't it true? We know that when Jesus died, things got really tough for them. The persecution's in there that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on today. That's just a result of standing with and for Jesus. They hated him. They're going to hate you. They insulted him. They're going to insult you. In the world that we live in, there are Christians being killed even now for their uncompromising faith in Jesus Christ. That's the world that we live in. Jesus said, that's okay. Look up because I've got a reward for you in heaven. This past Friday night, we started the book of 1 Thessalonians. And the Apostle Paul said, you know, I thank God for all of you. Now remember, he didn't know them personally very well. He was with them for less than four full weeks. They didn't know him very well. And yet God did such a supernatural work. He could say to them, I thank God for all of you continually in my prayers. And we might think, well, you know, that's just sort of spiritual hyperbole. 
I mean, if he didn't know him, how could he pray? How could he be grateful to God for him? That was a move of God's spirit on his heart. That's a true pastor's heart. And I cannot tell you how often Paul and I just get right to the verge of tears, thanking God for each and every one of you and the gift that you've been in our lives. This is the best family ever anywhere. And as a result, please remember this, you never have to go through anything alone. I've had the honor of being people with people on their deathbeds, comforting family. I've had the privilege, one of our birthday girls here today, had the privilege of being with her and with her husband when the doctor said there was no hope and she wasn't going to survive. Comforting her husband when he said to me, I, I couldn't possibly live without her, Pastor Ron. And I could say, God is good. And now she's celebrating another birthday many, many years after the fact. And we get to be involved in all of those things. That, Calvary Chapel, is the value of the body of Christ. And if you choose to do things alone, well, that's your burden to bear. And it isn't because you have to. It's because you've chosen to distance yourself from this family. So if you find yourselves among the offended because... Jesus is saying, or because I'm communicating today, that, that this family of faith has to be our priority, then you're missing out on what God has for you. It doesn't mean we stop loving our family. It doesn't mean that we ignore them. Just the opposite is true. We make them an object of our ministry, and we go and get them into the power of the Holy Spirit. And God will use your faithful witness. God will use your being sold out completely to him to try to woo them to him if you will just trust him. Paula has a family. Boy, does she have a family. One of our ladies says to her all the time, I'm your favorite daughter. <laughs> Another one says, well, I'm your easy labor daughter. <laughs> but we got a whole bunch of kids. And that just demonstrates how much God loves us. We never have to worry about whether God loves me. All we have to do is look at the gift that he's given us in Calvary Chapel. You are the best of the best in terms of gifts. Now, why is all that important? It's because they're going to face also 100 times as much persecution. They're going to have to have somebody around them, somebody to hold on to. When the times get difficult and we live in times that are going to get difficult and we all need to be prepared to face persecution in this country. It hasn't happened up to this point, but you can see how the tone of our culture is changing. And for the first time in the history, at least my life, we're the bad guys. We're the ones that are holding back all the progress. We're the ones that are making everybody so angry all the time. We have to be prepared for those persecutions. Jesus said he would be hated. Turns out he was right. Let's close with the last couple of verses. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later he will rise. Now two things, and I'll close in just a couple of moments. The first is that this is the third time that Jesus has told them that he's going to die He's prepared them or trying to prepare them for what lays ahead in their future. Three times they tune him out. They just don't hear this. Why don't they hear it? Because they don't want to hear it. It didn't meet their expectations. That's what they were not expecting. And so it's just sort of, they're going to continue. In fact, next week, James and John are going to approach him and say, we want you to do whatever we ask. And they're sending their mother, actually, to do the dirty work. Motive is everything, did I say? 
three times they tuned him out. They could have been prepared, but they weren't. And finally, just this thought. Jesus often spoke about his death, but he never spoke about his death without also mentioning his resurrection. In other words, no matter what you're going through, there's always hope. We serve a God who was murdered on the cross on the third day just as he promised he rose from the dead. Absolute proof that he is who he said he was. He claimed to be God. He proved that by not staying dead. He's alive today. He spoke about the realities of life. Things are going to be hard. Persecutions are in your future and they're going to kill me. You're going to be alone. They're about to tell him, be told that he won't leave them as orphans. He's going to send another him, the person of the Holy Spirit. But he's just saying, be ready for that. Now the lesson in this for us is we who have the most to be grateful for, we who've been given this wonderful family by the Lord, we who've been rescued from the pit of hell, we should be so grateful. Yeah, we need to be realists. realists. But we also have to stay focused on the hope. When we grumble and complain about circumstances, about how hard things are, when that's what people hear from us, we're misrepresenting Jesus, the one who's going to hand you those crowns and say, well done. We're misrepresenting him, and we need to stay focused. Yes, things are difficult, and to, to deny that is just to be in denial. That's dumb. But the reality is, and I don't mean this as a Christian cliche, but the reality is that no matter how hard things are, he loved me so much that he didn't leave me alone. I have you, and you have me. I need you, and you need me. And that's why the body of Christ is so important to a fruitful, vibrant Christian walk. What do you think Jesus' face looks like? We know that when the rich young ruler walked away sad, Jesus was sad. What do you think his face looks like now? In heaven, when he hears one of his own say, ah, I don't need church. Jesus says, wait a minute. This is, apart from the Holy Spirit, the best gift I've left you with. I've left you with one another. I hope and pray that it helps all of us reevaluate the benefit, the value of the church. Church at large is wonderful, but, but he works through local bodies. And maybe I'm a little biased, but I think we got the best one. Thank you. Because of what you contributed to our lives. Thank you so very, very much. Let's pray.